All right, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Tom Zalewski, and I'm with uh, Corefire. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about mobile commerce, uh, state of the market, where things are today, particularly with um, merchants, uh, end users, financial institutions, of course, uh, last and not least, uh, the carriers, wireless carriers. So. so on the agenda here, like I said, I'd like to just kind of go through these things and then go from remote payments into local payments, because you're going to see here in the next six, seven months kind of an explosion, I think, in local payments that's paying at the cash register. So a little bit of a audi audience participation. How many people have used uh, their phone for mobile commerce, like Starbucks application? A few people, OK. Um, ticketing, uh, airlines, American <coughs> Airlines, and, and that sort of thing. How many people have heard of near field communication? Oh, wow. OK, well, this is good. <laughs> this is good, So because that's one bullet item. Anyway, uh, just real quick, just to kind of frame everything, um, Corefire is a part of SK Group. SK is, I believe, the uh, third largest GDP in South Korea behind Samsung and LG. Um, within SK's uh, corporate structure, we have SK Group and then SKCNC, which is a holding company for SK Chemicals, SK Energy, a lot of different things. And then there was SK. Uh, CNC USA created under that, and under that was Corefire, which was a mobile commerce arm, because um, SK now believes, SKCNC believes that the timing is right now to expand the mobile commerce activities and interest from the merchants, transit agencies, financial institutions, although a lot of this and a lot of pilots have been going on, you know, for over a decade, way back to Palm Pilot days where you had infrared and Visa got up there and said, hey, this is a wave of the future. We're going to use your Palm Pilot, walk up to a vending machine, beam your credentials over to a vending machine to dispense uh, sodas and um, whatever. Um, and then we basically have three products. We've got a, a TSM, Trusted Service Manager, which I'll go into for those of you that have heard of NFC. Um, we have a mobile wallet, and there's lots of mobile wallets out there. Uh, Google Wallet is one of the ones that launched last year. Talk a little bit about that. And then we've got a suite of uh, loyalty products, couponing, um, gift cards, uh, membership cards, and things of that nature. Because payments alone with a mobile phone, while that's neat and cool, after people do that with the wallet, it's like, so what? I can pay with my phone. Yeah, it was neat. People looked at it. They thought I was cool. But after a while, you got to be able to do a lot more. So. Um, one of the things is, as you probably know, consumers are using mobile phones more and more. I believe it's 50% of um, adults actually have smartphones these days. Um, interesting thing, too, is a person, uh, average person, cell phone, they have with them over 14 hours during the day. Um, and actually, for the youth, it's even more. Text messaging is shooting through the roof, smartphones. Um, one of the things with, uh, with the kids that they, I was talking to somebody in the audience, um, they're so dependent on smartphones these days, they don't know how to do things manually. Maps goes, uh, location, all of this. I just grabbed my smartphone. And even now adults, they go to soccer games, and you look down, and a lot of them are looking at their phones you know, during the games and things like that. 79% um, of smartphone users use their phone to help with shopping. One of the, uh, the running jokes has been that uh, Best Buy is really the showroom for Amazon, where people go in and they touch and they feel the product, um, but then they, they look on their phone and say, hey, I can get it $30, $40 cheaper. And they may order it right there on their phone, or they may go home and order it online. Either way, there's more and more activity uh, with purchasing on the cell phone or smartphone, which again is considered remote payments. Um, smartphone adoption curve is going up. I think the prediction is by uh, 2015, 70% of adults will have a smartphone. Over here, what's interesting, too, is the operating systems. Um, it shows BlackBerry going down. What's uh, Android is going up and surpassed Apple, actually, in operating systems because they uh, have recruited numerous, numerous OEMs to uh, sell their platform on, like HTT, HTC, Samsung, and a bunch of other OEMs. And then one of the, uh, what's interesting, I asked the person that created this part of the slide, well, what about Symbian, which was Nokia operating system, and it couldn't have been more than seven, eight years ago, it was 40% of uh, phones uh, and smartphones were Symbian, and it quickly died, they're transitioning over to uh, 
Windows operating system, and I'll get a little bit into that as well. Um, but uh, in any case, as you can see there right now, there's uh, basically three operating systems, Windows a fourth, and Windows products are focusing again on mobile payments. So over this time, there's been some significant uh, events that have occurred around the world, everything from Visa acquiring Fundamo to go after unbanked or underbanked uh, folks that don't really have access to, to, mobile, to banks. And they do everything uh, real-time currency. And so a transition to use the phone as a bank or as an ATM, if you will, in a sense, with virtual cash to um, ISIS. And how many people have heard of this joint venture between the uh, tier one carriers, ISIS? Okay, that's an interesting one there. Um, when I get back at a little bit of the history in mobile commerce, there's always been this, this tension between, I see them on camera, tension between the financial institutions and, and the carriers uh, fighting for the consumer, considered either a card holder or a subscriber, and management of those, uh, that functionality. So uh, the carriers came together and they created this joint venture called ISIS, the carriers being T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, and AT&T. And the, the purpose of ISIS is to provide a mobile wallet and kind of a central uh, commonality to, to launch uh, mobile payments. Um, of that, they're going to launch. They've announced uh, they're launching the pilots in Salt Lake City and Austin. They're going to provide mobile phones, NFC mobile phones, and they've signed up many, many merchants in those cities. And the idea is to go uh, expansion uh, nationwide and then also bring on non-founding carriers to have a consistency. Their original uh, thoughts, at least in the press, were that they wanted to provide their own payment network um, versus uh, the card associations networks and then now they're an open platform for the financial institutions um, and kind of a hub. But uh, they came together primarily because they wanted to have some consistency. So you'll probably hear a lot about ISIS in the next one or two months when they actually do their commercial or their, their pilot launches. Uh, Google Wallet launched last year and there was a lot of excitement around that. It was contactless payments. Um, our platform was the over-the-air management platform to put credentials down into the phone, and that was with Citibank, MasterCard, Sprint, and, and Google, and then I think uh, Samsung devices that had to be enabled with this contactless technology. Point being that um, a lot of uh, activities have occurred. There's a lot more in the works that haven't been announced. <coughs> so a um, little bit of an overview in the retail space. It's believed that... Uh, M-commerce is going to take off faster than e-commerce has as far as purchasing things online at home on a, on a computer. Uh, retailers, and something we've learned in early trials, they love the fact that real time that they can address their audience. Um, a Sears may know when I leave the store because I've paid, but they may not know I'm in the store to change my behavior real time. They may not even know I'm in the mall. Now with a mobile device and some applications on there and things like that, whether it's uh, GPS or, or other ways, Bluetooth, they might know that Tom's in the mall. Now how do I get Tom to come into the store, you know, and how do I get him to change his behavior because I have an excess of one type of inventory in a grocery store? They may know I buy dog food, they issue me a coupon on the back of my receipt as I'm leaving, hoping that I can come back in and make a purchase later versus changing my behavior when I come into the store. Um, what else can I say about this slide? Uh, again, it's, it has to do with the smartphones, the functionality, having a, a connected token, payment token. Um, retail, mobile site uh, traffic has grown over the years and tracking everything in the past few years of spending. And there is a belief in the market that this is, is going to take off and it's going to take off quickly, more so than it has over the past decade both in remote payments, remote purchases, uh, using your browser, and local payments, paying with your device, emulating a credit card. So uh, contactless payments, and I want to drill into that versus other forms of local payments, infrared, Starbucks with the 2D barcode where you go in and you put your phone down and it scans that, which were all different types of, of ways to circumvent using contactless until the phones came to market, until the, the contactless readers had been deployed with the merchants. Um, so one thing I'd like to do, and I was involved in a lot of these trials and a lot of these activities, um, everything from uh, Tricon, which I think now is Yum Brands, 
to various different other merchants, um, everything from uh, Brinker International, which was a group of, I think, Chili's, Bennigan's, and different merchants, uh, working with MasterCard and some of the contactless early payment trials, just to understand the consumer's behavior around the phone as a payment device, what they wanted to do, what they liked, what they didn't like, and then educate the merchants uh, quite a bit on the fact that now you've got a, a connected device, you can drive traffic real time into the stores and educate the merchants about you know the or edu the merchants about the emergence of mobile phones and what uh, smartphones and what you can do. So uh, initially, with these phones, there were contactless tags. I don't know uh, too how many of you have a contactless credit card in your in your wallet or are familiar with PayPass, PayWave. Anybody? Okay, just a few. Tons of marketing dollars. Mastercard is put behind PayPass. Visa's put behind PayWave to get the banks to sign up with a contactless credit card. And there's been numerous times I go into a store and I see these contactless readers and I'll ask the, the cashier, what's this? Sometimes they know, most of the time they don't. Because um, things haven't really taken off. But the idea was to have much more um, friendly user experience instead of swiping a credit card with a mag stripe, I would tap my credit card. At the end of the day, uh, you know, things have been kind of, uh, they haven't taken off as fast as the card associations and banks would have liked them to. Now, we went ahead and put the same tag technology into phones and we created uh, a messaging platform for the merchants to be able to go ahead and drive traffic into the stores. On the key findings, using a mobile phone for payments have to be easier than what people currently do. If you and I are talking about the game last night, we walk into Taco Bell, I can pull out my card, pay without missing a beat, having a good conversation. If I've got to stop, unlock my phone, turn on an application, think about what I'm doing, break my train of thought, I'm not gonna do it. You know, now if there's loyalty points and things tied to it, possibly I will. Um, simple, reliable, and secure. Big question people always have, what if I lose my phone? I've been in some board meetings with some, some folks that you know, ask all these questions, and I'll ask some of these uh, C guys, if you have to leave the room and leave your wallet or leave your credit card, I'm sorry, your wallet or your phone, you have to leave one of those, what would you leave? And half the room says, I'd leave my wallet because I have to have my phone. The other half says, I I'd leave my phone, my assistant can get me another phone, I've been through this fraud thing with the banks, I, I don't want to deal with it. So, well, if you have everything in the phone, in one device, then it's the best of both worlds. So we're moving in that direction. When we get driver's license and phones, that's another thing. But it still has to be simple, reliable, and secure. Um, two key players, I'll get in the ecosystem in a minute, but the two key players, of course, are the, the merchants. If the merchants don't see value in this, to change your point of sale, train their staff with a high turnover that goes on, um, and they're not seeing immediate up, upsell in products or customer loyalty uh, through traffic, they're not going to adopt it. The consumers, again, they have to have speed, convenience, they need to feel special. There's got to be a value for them to change their, their ways. Um, this is a timeline of the trials that went on. So again, initial trials were contactless with just a tag. You couldn't lock the phone. In other words, it's like leaving your credit card. Somebody could pick it up, take your phone, tap on a reader. There was no way to lock the phone. You were tied to one credit card, one loyalty program, one item. And these were generally closed loop systems. Uh, mobile speed pass, anybody use mobile speed pass? Same sort of thing. It was, you know, and in, in, uh, mobile tried to break out and go into McDonald's and QSRs and, and expand that from the pump and, and the C store. Um, then we got into these uh, taking closed loop payments, which again were something like a mobile speed pass, if you will. There were other companies out there, Two Scoot, Freedom Pay, and you know, prepaid type of things, postpaid, but they were closed loop. Everything had to be tied together to taking a MasterCard and putting that on a tag and installing it in a phone and then adding messaging for the merchants. Then NFC with Near Field Communications, um, the first trial was done in uh, Atlanta in Philips Arena. Philips was one of the uh, inventors of, of NFC, or I think the inventor of NFC, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> NXP. But these were pre-provisioned phones, if you will. The first NFC phone here, first NFC phone here 
actually had all the technology in the back cover. It would snap on the phone, you had a data port, it, you could take a phone off the shelf for this one particular product Nokia had, add NFC to it. One of the challenges were, do I provision the phones and then put them in the arena and pass them out, um, hand them to the trial users, which half the group said yes, we want to do that because we want to have touchy-feely, show the user how to turn the phone on, how to turn it off, how, how to get to the phone book, all these things. And the other group said no, we can't pre-provision these things and leave them stored in an unsecure arena, our Philips arena, we have to treat it like a credit card. So let's provision the phones, mail them to the homes, and let people, it was, neither was a good solution. You, you've got a credit card, you have a phone, how, how do you deal with it? So we basically passed phones out in the arena, trained the folks on how to use the phone. They mailed a second cover to their house that was manually provisioned. They put the new cover, take the old cover off, put the new cover on, and they had their device. They also had something called service discovery, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but that was manual provisioning, not a lot of value. Over the air provisioning, which now gets into the technology where I can manage these devices remotely, download credit cards, lock credit cards, my phone's missing, it's stolen, they can lock these things over the air. That's where the value comes in. The trials stopped at 2007 because after that there was an explosion of trials globally around the world. Um, Near field communications, it's, it's a form of contactless, or RFID for those that are familiar with that term. One, it does card emulation, so it can emulate a contactless card, whether it's building access, whether it's a credit card, anything contactless, contactless tags. It also can read tags, or it can act as a reader or an interrogator. So I saw something uh, both in the DFW airport, I didn't have time to put the pictures into the presentation, but DFW airport and Chicago airport, there was an advertisement, touch your Samsung phone here to download exclusive content. And basically it would go to a website, confirm that it's a Samsung phone, Galaxy S3, and it would give you a song. So they're kind of promoting NFC. First time I've seen that, say commercially, and at least in two airports. The problem was the marketing, it said, touch here to get exclusive music. And as I was taking the picture of this walking through the airport, there were three flight attendants. And one of them saw that, she goes up and starts tapping the sign with her hand because it says touch here and nothing's happening so I said no 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 you gotta tap with your phone so she grabs her phone again the phone is easier to grab than your wallet starts tapping with her phone I'm like no 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 you have to have one of these special phones and I took a it wasn't a Samsung phone it was a Nokia phone but I, I put it up there and it, it did its thing and she said oh that's too much trouble I don't I don't want to bother with this you know that's neat but you know so there again user adoption change of behavior then peer-to-peer -peer communication, this is where two devices can talk to each other. <coughs> business card is one use case example where you may have a tag in your business card, you pass it around the room, you're never gonna run out of business cards. By the same token, you leave a conference room, you're not carrying you know, 25, 50 business cards with you, you tap the card, it went around, all the, all the contact information is loaded in your phone, it syncs with Outlook and you're done. Um, whether we'll get rid of paper, uh, Business cards is another story, just like we'll probably never get rid of cold, hard cash. Um, but we want to kind of displace it. Uh, key findings, I may have touched on those. The manual provisioning, it's not scalable, which is over the air. Um, OTA is, is critical. And then it consumers like the ability to tap. The, the, you know, the 2D barcodes and, and other things um, that uh, you know, you take a picture with that to get content. I don't know that the uptake is quite a bit because you have to unlock your phone, you have to turn the application on, you've got to point your phone. How many people have used those QR codes or quick codes? And Okay, so that's good, that's good. I, I asked my son who's 18, a, a kids, and he said no, it's, nobody uses it. As far as the kids go, it's, it's a lot of trouble. So again, now NFC today. Um, Handsets are coming out. I'll go through this slide pretty quick. We're seeing these. Um, at least half a dozen manufacturers have announced they're going to provide NFC phones. The carriers clearly, in, in launching some pilots, they have to have phones in the pipeline to do this. And um, I guess I'll, I'll move on here. I have about 10 minutes left. Things are ramping up. Now, there was hype back in 2007, 2008, a lot of analysts said by 2011, 50% of the phones will be NFC enabled. A lot of the same analysts, they're saying these things today. Um, 
What happened was one, lack of standardization, and two, the political aspects around all the players in the ecosystem that have to play together nicely to be able to provide this service. It's an extremely complicated ecosystem. Um, deployment on the handsets, um, 160 pilots. Again, a lot of these phones were commercial, pre-commercial phones. Some were commercial for these pilots. Um, I will say that, that every, um, every country and every system is a little bit different. In Europe, it's primarily transportation and, and ticketing. The U.S. is primarily payment. And then Asia is a little bit of both. Um, but even uh, 10 years ago, a lot of the transit agencies were contactless. They were looking at ways to get this into the phone. Um, stakeholders, your wireless carriers, they own the device because they subsidize it. They own the SIM card, and they have what they call the subscriber. Um, handset manufacturers that are building these devices, I can tell you back when I was with the handset manufacturer five, six years ago, we even go to the carriers. We'll put this technology in for free, right? Your bill of material won't change. They didn't want it. I said, no, 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 no. They don't understand enough about the ecosystem. They felt it was a Trojan horse. We take this, and somebody else is going to manage it and control it. So until they really understood what the business model was, how they could leverage it, you could give it away. They, they didn't want it. Payment associations that set all the rules, Visa, MasterCard. Merchants, of course, key player. And then um, new entrants like Google Wallet that came out. And there's others, PayPal, that are doing things that aren't necessarily NFC because they don't have access to secure parts of the phone where all this information is stored and managed. Um, that's the complexity there. I won't go into a lot of detail, but you have the financial institutions on one side, the carriers on the other. You know, if I'm a Sprint and I have my subscriber and he has a Citibank card, I've got to work with Citibank. If he's got a Chase card, I've got to work with Chase. If he's got a Wells card, I've got to work with Wells. So it gets kind of complicated for Sprint. By the same token, if I'm Chase, my card holders could be um, Sprint, T-Mobile, C Spire, any of these guys. And this has been a lot of the problem in, in takeoff from the early estimations to where we are today. Um, so there's, there was this thing called a uh, originally trusted third party. Nokia spun out a joint venture I was a part of with Gisek and Deverant, uh, the uh, SIM cards providers, to create this uh, trusted third party to kind of manage all of this. And now it was coined uh, officially trusted service manager. So a third party that really is neutral can work with financial institutions to securely pass card data down to what's called a secure element in the phone that the carrier primarily owns in a lot of cases. Management of the secure element, kind of a gatekeeper. It's kind of virtual real estate, condo on the beach, if you think about it. You can lease space out in this uh, secure element to different application <coughs> issuers, financial institutions, ticketing companies, things like that, transit. But um, some of the carriers not only wanted to lease space, they wanted to collect a fee on whatever was going on in that space. So if I'm buying something at Best Buy, carrier would like to first charge that financial institution or that credit card issuer to lease the space, then, then they would like to charge and get a piece of the transaction. Kind of difficult to do when the merchants already don't like the fees that they pay for uh, credit cards. Um, in reality, trusted service managers become a little more complicated today, but I won't get into that with the time I have left. Um, key, key functions of a, of a trusted service manager, again, is just management of this secure element, maybe some contractual agreements working between the carriers and the financial institutions, and be, becoming kind of a central hub to be able to pass all this, to, because it's going to be massive once things start to happen. Um, in reality, a bank may have their TSM, a carrier may have their TSM. In the case of ISIS with uh, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, their TSM is ISIS. So the banks have to work with ISIS, but they may want their own TSM, so you'll have a primary and a secondary, or what's called an SPTSM, service provider, and then a, an M&O, M&O being a carrier, TSM. And the ecosystem, again, is complex, because you have to look at the money flow, you have to look at who gets paid, all of these players have to share some revenue and make some money at it, otherwise it won't happen. Um, this shows a little bit more. Again, the key thing is the secure element. There's been lots of uh, land grabs over that, if you will. That secure element can come in the form it's embedded in the phone, which again, the OEMs may want control of that, the Motorola's or Samsung's or Nokia's. 
It can be on the SIM cards, which is a carrier's preferred method because they own that SIM card. They control it. It can go from phone to phone to phone, managing that. Or it can be something like on a micro SD, which initially there have been some companies that announced this technology on a micro SD. The banks loved it. Visa was behind it 100% because we don't have to work with the carriers. We can issue a micro SD, give it to the user. He can put it in his phone, certain phone, load a wallet, and away he goes. We don't have to really deal with the carriers at all. Problem was, Chase issues a micro SD. I carry several credit cards. You probably carry several credit cards, debit cards. Chase issues that. Is Bank of America going to want to put their credentials on a piece of hardware that Chase distributes and owns? Probably not. So you're probably limited to one application, maybe a transit application, maybe one credit card, that sort of thing. Plus, some of the newer phones, they're not coming with micro SD slots anymore. Bill of materials, carriers saying, we don't, we don't want to order this phone with the slot. We don't need the slot. We have more memory on the phone. Plus, these guys are trying to sideload things, and you know, it's no slots. So uh, iPhone's a perfect example. You want more memory? You buy the next model up. You can't use a micro SD, that sort of thing. So, oh, last two slides. Again, what the value in mobile payments and contactless is, is not only just making a payment, it's all these other things such as loyalty, couponing. If I go into a grocery store today, I have to tap my membership card. Then I have to give them all my receipts. That's step two. And then step three, I finally have to pay. It would be nice if I could just tap my phone, it passes my uh, membership credentials, it passes my coupons, which maybe get sorted out on the back end and reconciled, and it'll push the coupons that aren't valid back over to my phone over the air. Third thing is it does my payment all in one tap. You know, that's ideal. Then there's things too in some of the studies and focus groups. Some people don't use coupons. They're because they're of, um, I don't know, uh, shameless. The, these electronic coupons where you tap, you get your discount. It's called shameless coupons because I don't have to fuss with the coupons or look like I'm doing things. Um, so there's the value there with kind of combining all these services. And then you tie in things like GPS, of course you opt in, or I come into a store, I tap to say I'm here, and then they can push coupons relevant to my purchasing behavior to me real time so I can get the best, um, best value. And really that's it. You know, we have again, payment credentials on one side, why I have to transact, my merchants, and then my rewards, and your product manufacturers down there that are pushing the coupons, loyalty programs, and things like that. And that's it. I think I'm uh, right on time. Are there any kind of questions? <coughs> yes? Is there any place in the world that this Zacco system is really working well, all the pieces? Um, for payments in retail, Google Wallet launched last year. Things kind of took off and then they slowed down. They have subscri uh, signed up over a million subscribers. That's Some, in the United States? That's in the U.S. Well, I'm asking about any country in the world with this entire ecosystem, transport, near field communications, cooperation between the wireline phone, the merchant, the bank, any place that actually. Working. I know in India, um, one company launched a trial with 3,000 users. I think there's actually some commercial activity in India, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to go back and look. I'm mostly focused on Europe and, and North America. Uh, company, uh, Latin America, there's not much contactless infrastructure. Things are changing quickly. I mean, if you look at the point of sale, you go into some of these small shops, they have an iPad now. Their point of sale is the iPad or things like Square, where I've got my little box, I plug into my iPhone. If I'm an electrician, plumber, I'm somebody, you know, mobile in the field, I can swipe a credit card. That's going to start to be contactless, those type of things. So the point is sales changing, where um, if you've got a tablet and it has NFC, I can tap my device to that tablet and it's a much richer experience. So as, as far as your question, yes, there are some small things that are commercial and different. And again, uh, India, Asia, and in um, there's been some commercial transit. I think Transport for London is doing something commercial as well. But there's not the, the payment infrastructure. I could get into things like EMV contact cards that launched in Europe. And now in Canada is 100% EMV. Big push in the US to go with chips in the cards for security reasons, because you can uh, 
duplicate mag stripe. So if you're going to go make all that change for contact, also make it contactless, which then supports <coughs> NFC. Any other questions? Yes. Just a question about, um, you talked about security on the transactional side. <clears throat> what about hacking? Because with, with, it feels like you have the <coughs> NFC enablement of devices and also wireless, contactless credit cards. Um, the initial deployment seems to be limited in the size of the transaction to like $10 or 10 pounds yes. in the UK because, you know, it, it's so easy to just pick up the card and just start paying with wirelessly without no authentication, no free authentication. <coughs> so how, how is that, how do you see that sort of evolving? Because I think the biggest barrier for you, the ubiquitousness or the pervasiveness of NFC or contactless payment would be to be able to replace alternative forms of payment or existing forms of payment. If you've got these limitations and risks around hacking, well, you know, this uh, EuroPay MasterCard Visa spec for contact cards, I think, pretty much eliminated fraud in Europe. Um, now, this, you know, it's a similar technology, but it's contact. You have a chip on the card, you put it into a machine, it makes physical contact. They also have contactless EMV. There's much security around that, much encryption versus a mag stripe. So, you know, you have to look at the standards, specifications, NFC forum global platform, Smart Card Alliance, that pulls a lot of this together, and I'm not an expert in encryption, but the hackers don't want your money, they don't want my money, they want the bank's money, they, they go after the big things and put the focus on that. They don't worry about getting into my device, per se, because they're not going to, you know, it's not worth their trouble to, to get into my device or your device or any, you know, they want, they want the big money. And by then, trying to get into a device, it, it's nearly impossible you'd have to look at the specs and everything that backs up. But mag stripes are simple. They're very simple. I can tell you stories on how quickly, the, Joe the waiter who started this morning, I'm giving, you know, I won't give him my phone. You, you, you sit down in a restaurant, you're not gonna give Joe your phone, but you'll give me your credit card. And it takes him 30 seconds or less to swipe that, swipe that mag stripe data. That's where eliminating a lot of that fraud goes on, you know, versus the, the actual security in there, and this trusted service manager, these secure elements, and, and everything that goes on. Anything else? Yes? On a <coughs> prepaid scenario, who holds the money? Prepaid, it can be closed loop, like a PayPal type of an account where it might be topped up. You know, toll tags are topped up, it's a prepaid. So entities that may, they may top up with an ACH where, you know, their fees are a lot less. So it wouldn't be the operator. No, it would be probably a bank in the background. I don't think the operator wants to get into uh, the payment business because of the liability and all the certifications. And their expertise is wireless devices, networks. It's not, it's not um, you know, they, they're not going to become a bank. They'll get a partner who, who knows what they're doing in that respect. Now, I'm not saying they, not all of them, somebody might go off and do it. Obviously, with the carriers forming ISIS, they wanted to initially announce to create their own payment network. In many countries, there'll be like a license issue because you actually take the deposit. Now, right? Yes, but you think about prepaid mobile these days, and folks that use prepaid mobile and they get their paycheck at the end of the week, they go in and they top up their prepaid wireless. At the same time, they could top up their prepaid payment. So the guys that provide the prepaid wireless and and that type of credit could get into into the uh, the payments as well. All right, well, thank you.